hello, hello, hello. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Sliding Into My DMs, part of the D4 network. This is the show in the network that's basically a D&D talk show. Um, we talk about D&D rules, we talk about D&D news, and basically just, um, you know, talk about how to make sure that everyone at our table is having as much fun as possible, both from a DM and a player perspective. So anyway, uh, my name's Colby. I'm your host. Thanks for being here. And uh, with me, as always, we have some of uh, my DMs. We've got uh, Corey here. We've got Dallin, Mr. Rogers, the Blackthorn, and uh, we've got Tori, the Dungeon Mistress herself. So Hang on, hang on, hang on. I see new ink on Dallin. Yes. Speaking of Blackthorn, yeah. let, us uh, let us take a look there. It's healing, so it's still got that like clear bandage, and it's kind of soupy, uh -huh. but... Uh, so a couple cool. days that'll look really good. So cool. for, for the uninitiated, Dallin, what are we looking at there? This is uh, the chapter heading in Stormlight Archive for Kaladin Stormblast. Mm -hmm. so. Very cool. Very, very cool. And um, congratulations on your haircut, by the way. Looks sharp. Yeah. It was getting, <laughs> it was getting a little uh, quarantine-y. <laughs> So, quarantini um, is my yes. favorite type of martini. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Tori, is, th is this Tori in space or is this? Uh, no. It's the birthing, the birthing portal. <laughs> 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 A new character is about to be born. <laughs> For those who have not yet seen the most recent uh, episode of Tales of an Area, uh, it was a one shot this week. And uh, because Preston and I were gone and uh, somebody needed their face punched. And so uh, Corey put together a little one shot for everyone uh, so that they could accomplish said face punching. And um, it was actually a lot of fun. I just finished watching it myself and uh, had many, many laugh out loud moments. So kudos to you guys for, for making it entertaining. Yeah, it was great. I hope the little hopes come back someday too. Like that, that's a fun little group. I know. I was like, oh, I want to be part of the littlest <laughs> hope or the little hopes, I guess. Um, I need to make myself a little, a little gnome or halfling or kobold. Or goblin. Or goblin. Plenty of goblins. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's be honest. It's me. I'd do a custom lineage and choose the small option and then yeah well that's what i mean that's what um scott did he did okay. that custom lineage that's and he right because he was day. that otter yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was cool uh, we came up with literally five new races because of that uh or rather sub races <laughs> of uh one race and then another tinier race anyway there was a lot of uh races that came out of that one idea so i was right. very happy with it right well um let's see other news the only thing is for those who are waiting um we are planning on recording the 20k celebration even though i'm i think i'm at like 21,000 now <laughs> subscribers um this weekend uh and then i'm hoping that i get it edited in time <laughs> for me to release it <laughs> maybe the following week if i just don't sleep very much maybe um Don't so anyway sleep. i know i've i've not had much in the last year <laughs> <laughs> i'm used to it um anyway so stay tuned and uh, yeah we'll try and get that out to you guys as soon as possible we're all very excited and nervous and uh, or i don't know about you guys i'm nervous but whatever i've got tori on my team so i'll be fine i'm ready to sow yeah. chaos that's for sure <laughs> yeah yeah that's actually why i'm nervous is because i have Corey on my team so yeah, exactly they kind of balance each other out <laughs> um no anyway it'll be fun okay let's jump in to the episode so as usual i have two things to talk about first we've got a quick ruling and then a longer conversation topic and so for the quick ruling this actually the more that i've thought about it and looked at it the more i'm i'm sort of tempted to not even call this a quick ruling. It might just be more like a public service announcement as a reminder as, you know, how, as to how the rules work, because I think at least for me personally, there's some nuances here that we're going to discuss that I've kind of been like, oh yeah, like I forgot that it worked that way, or I haven't been sure if it's really worked that way. Um, and this is something important to keep in mind, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys will end up, you know, disagreeing on, what I think is a fairly clear interpretation of, of these rules here. But I wanted to talk about 
um, Warcaster, the Warcaster feat, and how it might interact with um, certain spells. So, uh, so let me set it up here first. As far as Warcaster goes, uh, we are told that when a hostile creature's movement provokes an opportunity attack from you, you can use your reaction to cast a spell at the creature rather than making an opportunity attack, right? So normally somebody moves out of our reach, we make a melee weapon attack against them, but if we take the Warcaster feat, we can instead, if we want, cast a spell. Um, the spell must have a casting time of one action and must target only that creature. Where it gets a little bit tricky for me is the way that this potentially interacts with opportunity attack, right? Because we're told when we make an opportunity attack, um, you use your reaction and the attack occurs right before the creature leaves your reach. So what I've been thinking about is how this might potentially interact with a couple of things. For example, let's talk about Booming Blade first. Mm -hmm. with, with Booming Blade, right? You make your, you make, it's a cantrip, but as part of the cantrip, you make a weapon attack. And thereafter, if the creature moves uh, of their own will, essentially, then they take additional damage, right? So I guess my question, I think I know the answer, but the question is, so if I have Warcaster, they're going to move. And since I have Warcaster, I can cast a spell. Therefore, I use Booming Blade hit them with an attack, and now if they move, they take damage. Do they just basically automatically take that extra damage for moving because I'm hitting them sort of as they're moving? Or is there something going on there where maybe like, I don't know, either the DM might say, oh, in that case, they change their mind because they don't want to move anymore now to take that extra damage. Or do they move to the next square? But now if they move after that, they're going to take some additional damage. Do you know what I mean? So tell me what you guys think. This is twofold that we're looking at here. Uh, number one, opportunity attacks say that you attack the target just before it leaves your reach. Mm -hmm. Basically, before it moves five feet, more than five feet away from you right? So your attack hits right at that edge of that five feet as you slice at it with booming blades specifically, mm -hmm. and then they become wreathed, and then they have another five feet of movement before it triggers, right? Because it has to say that they move five feet, not if they move at all, but if they move five or more feet. Mm -hmm. So in, in my opinion, they would, wait, they would literally get to the next square with that wreath of thunder damage sure. and go, okay, now what? However, okay. This comes up with the the whole idea of what exactly does a monster know? What exactly does sure, sure. Uh, a being know? Like uh, a wolf that's trying to just run away might not realize the energy surrounding it's it. Sheathed in thunderous mm -hmm. energy. Yeah, and it might it might continue to try and run. If something is trying to move away from you and provoking an opportunity attack, then it's already willing to take damage to get away. Right. So maybe it's willing to take a little bit more damage to run further. Yeah, I I'd say as a DM, I might I might give it like a wisdom or intelligence saving throw to kind of think about what just happened and this new energy surrounding it because it is a a physical presence that it can see or a magical presence that it can see. Um, and if it makes it save, then it can make its decision based on what's sure. best for it at that moment. Sure. But if it doesn't move anywhere, it's still like in danger. Right. Like right. either way, it, it's a it's a matter of do I take the do I take the D eight or two D eight or do I or do I stay here and take all another round of attacks because right. I was trying to get away from it. Right. So I I think that it I I I think that they get the choice if they can recognize it, but I don't think that really changes. The math too much unless your dm is just trying to be as uh, tactical as possible sure then you know then you're playing a game where that's a, a unique possibility and sure if that's the case you just have to deal with it okay you know what that's interesting i actually hadn't thought of that that sometimes i think a little bit too much like snap to the grid mm -hmm. right and Same. so yeah it's it's like they're either here or they're here and they're nowhere in between yeah uh, and it doesn't always necessarily work that way right so yeah I, I i can get that like they they're they're moving away from you and right before essentially they get at the very edge of you know your your reach you can hit them but that does but they might only move you know whatever if they move two or three feet away from you and you hit them and then they're going to move two or three more feet to get into the next square. They haven't moved five feet yet. So technically they don't trigger, the, you know, the booming yeah. blade. 
Um, yeah, that's an interesting interpretation uh, that I hadn't thought of. So good. This mm-hmm. is a little bit interesting. Um, what do you guys think, Dallin, Tori? Yeah, um, I, I like that. Um, I think that's pretty good. I think I would rule it more snap to the grid style just for sure. the sake of clarity and say, okay, yeah, they, they got hit. And if I had already decided as a DM that they're you know, moving and they're going to take an opportunity attack, then yeah, they're just going to take the damage mm-hmm. when they move. Um, but yeah, I, I don't disagree with what's, what Corey says. It's just, I think at my table, I would rule it just snap to the grid five feet just for brevity and keeping it all the same for everybody. Okay. Tori. Yeah. My initial thought process was just like Dallin's snap to the grid, but I really like Corey's idea. So I think that he has convinced me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess in that case, the, the second sort of part of this um, is maybe less a question and more of a, here's something to think about players and DMs, you know, when, if you find yourself in this situation, because normally when you are making a ranged attack against a creature and there is a hostile enemy within five feet of you, that attack is made with disadvantage, right? And so if in your head you're thinking, oh, this is great, like uh, they're moving away from me and I'm a spellcaster, I'm going to hit them with Scorching Ray or something like that. Um, You're likely, unless your DM rules otherwise, obviously, I think the interpretation of the rules would be that you're going to make that with disadvantage. Unless you have a feat like, say, Crossbow Expert that lets you you know, not suffer disadvantage in that situation. Um, Does crossbow expert work with everything? It works with attacks. Just ranged attacks. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's specify. a little bit more OP it's, than it's, I thought It's it a was. little weird. I mean, and there are feats like that that are like, mm-hmm. like, in fact, on my, my Blade Singer Nova build, I took the gunner feat, even though I never use a gun because I get a plus one <laughs> dexterity and because I have it, because part of it is that, as well that you can make ranged attacks without suffering disadvantage if cool. a hostile enemy is within five feet of you anyway yeah uh, i think, I think you, nova i think you pick up uh if you're going to take warcaster you're already planning to pick up something like shocking grasp mm-hmm. or some uh form of spell that requires a saving throw instead sure. like toll the dead mm-hmm. or some other thing so that if somebody moves away from you then you can toll the dead them for one d12 damage and there's no disadvantage because saving throws don't work like that yeah right and D- just for clarity warcaster requires that it is a cantrip that correct not no not any, it's a spell just a spell okay spell. you move five feet away from me fireball <laughs> well no no the spell can't the spell has to target a single enemy so it can't be okay. an area um, Time to make up the single fire target ball or singer single fire target ball. And okay, never mind. Mm-mm. Nope, I'm like gonna make it. That. I'm, but, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be my build next week. The single fire target ball. Hold on, I'm writing that down. <laughs> Perfect. Glad I could help. Um, just do magic missile. It's just a free yep, magic, magic missile. missile. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and actually, that's a, that's a good point because magic missile, there's no roll; it just automatically mm-hmm. hits. So the disadvantage doesn't apply, right? It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Okay. Or you could just be really good with crossbows, and that means that you can cast ranged spells without a disadvantage. Apparently. <laughs> when I was younger, I practiced <laughs> with my crossbow hitting targets that were close to me. And later on, when I learned how to cast spells those same skills that I learned in my youth applied. That's, that's what they tell you in school about math. You're going oh, yeah. to use this one day. <laughs> that's right. Dad, one day there's going to be a target within I'm five feet. I'm sick of you. trying to hit you when you're only five <laughs> feet away from me with my crossbow. Son, trust me, one day you will use this. <laughs> my entire party died because I couldn't do this. So now you have to. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, let us know in the comments if you disagree or have additional light to potentially shed on our little ruling mm-hmm. public service announcement. Um, the more you know. Okay. Uh, thanks. Let's move on to the longer conversation. Okay. So I'm really excited about the topic today, and I've been wanting to talk about it for quite some time now. And 
never quite known how to like <sighs> put what I want to say like succinctly, which I know is really surprising considering it's me and I'm like the most mm. concise speaker <laughs> ever. Concise, everything Completely. is very short and to the yeah, point. Exactly. And you never meander. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And never a wasted word. Um and, and I'm a little bit nervous about this one, actually, as well, just because, well, I don't know. We'll see. This is, I think this is going to be a little unorganized, and it's going to be a little more freeform than I tend to like to be. But I'm just going to do my preamble, and then we're going to chat. So um, I want to talk about, like, getting into your character's head and, like, being a better role player, I guess, like trying to think and act and speak as your character would and why that is important or when we should maybe not worry about it too much, potentially. Um, and so so here's my thoughts. Um, I think, and, I, and I'm just going to read my script because I'm too, I'm going to be too rambly otherwise. Okay. Um, I think that like so many of us have played video games for so many years, or at least speaking personally, right? That sometimes we get really accustomed to just like this mentality of get quest, go to the place I'm supposed to go, like kill the 10 monsters or whatever, right? Along the way, I may have random encounters a la Final Fantasy where I'm just walking down the road and oh, now we're fighting. Okay, and then back on the road, here we go, you know, kind of thing that sometimes like we, or okay, I, I'm, I'm going to stop saying we, sometimes I um, forget to like try to think and act and talk like my character would, right? So like in video games, we, we often, I often don't question like my character's motive or the motives of the NPCs necessarily because, well, like this was how the game was written. And like, I clearly need to follow this fairly linear path usually even in the even in the open world rpgs like compared to dnt fairly linear right path to get to the end of the game um but in dungeons and dragons it's so much richer than that and i think that's the thing that most of us or one of the things anyway that most of us who play really love about it right is just the absolute freedom um but also greater capacity for role play and really diving into a character, making it our own, living in their head, being that character, right? Doing what we think that character would do and saying what we think they would do, all those kinds of things. Um, and, and so like sometimes I forget to put myself in my character's head and just kind of go, okay, like this is obviously what I'm supposed to do now or okay, we just had a random encounter and we killed some monsters and like on we go, you know, instead of asking things like, why is this NPC asking me to do X, right? What's their motivation? And, and does that align with what my character wants or is interested in? You know, why would my character be interested in doing this thing that they're asking me to do? And, and like exploring those things like motivation and reasoning and what impact my actions might have on the larger world, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so... I guess what I'm wondering generally is like, how can we as players get better at that? Um, and how can we as dungeon masters and game masters facilitate and encourage that as well? If, if all of that rambling makes sense. So um, yes, I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out there, open it up to you guys, and we're just going to bounce off each other. So what are your thoughts? I actually have well, a counter argument, so I'll let somebody else go. Sure, Sorry. sure. Yeah, go ahead, Tori. What? Yeah, Ooh. I know. <laughs> Prepare to fight. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I am very passionate about this particular subject. <laughs> and I think maybe some of that stems from really enjoying the theater and having like a theater heavy background. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the role play aspect is my favorite part of the game. So we, we had a little situation 
I, I say a situation, but we, we, we ha- had a run, a run. I keep making it sound like it was a horrible thing. No. We had a huge fight. <laughs> there was a big um, problem. <laughs> no, that's not the major. right word either. It was a disaster. No, that, that, that doesn't sound right mm-hmm. either. <laughs> Monumental mishap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. World ending. <laughs> yeah. It, it, in our own um, little game. Right. So yeah. Corey and I were on the same page. We know what we're talking about here. I, everyone knows because I brought it up to the group. So it, we, we, in, in our tales of an area game, you can watch it here. Um, we, our, our little group had, had come together and we had been asked to go to this sanctum to do these things. And then we came back and then um, it kind of came to a point where it was like, okay, well, like what now? Like, what, what do we do now? We had a choice to like travel together um, or to kind of go our merry ways. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was like, well, why, like, why would my character want to be with these people? Like I just barely met them. And, and I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm relating it to real life. Like if I had just barely met some random strangers, me, Tori, I'm probably not going to go and, and be like best friends with them and, and continue to live with them and have an adventure with them for the next, who knows how long, like that's, right. that is not in my nature. So, so for me, I was like, that just seems weird. It seems weird not to have a motivation to go with them. And so I I had kind of brought it up to the group and I was like, I just don't really know like, um, why, why we're doing this. And, and, you know, there were arguments for and against it. Like one argument was like, well, why not? Like, why can't just a bunch of people get together and, and just go and do stuff? And I was like, well, like from a story perspective, like that just doesn't, it needs to be more authentic and and feel real. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And again, that's like the the theater nerd coming out of me. Like (laughs) I wanted to have this, this motivation and have it mean something. Um, and for me as a player, I had to discover what that was to make it more meaningful to continue on in the game and make it feel authentic. So do I think having a motivation is important? Absolutely. Um, and like I said, I I think it enrich and enriches the game Enrichens? (laughs) Enrichens? <laughs> Enrichens. <laughs> Rich. I would have let it go. Out. Like it, Enriches other than my weird is not look. a word. <laughs> enriches. It enriches the game. Um, and the experience for me as a player. So that's my first argument for, yes, you should have a motivation and get inside that character's head to make the game more meaningful and um, I, I think a little more fun. Now, what, what's that counter argument, Corey? Because I'm really interested yeah, sure. in what it is. Uh, well, so I, I want to point out something else is you are you don't have any sort of background in gaming other than D&D, right? Like you, you don't really play, you I didn't don't really play, play video games. Video games, no. Yeah, and and that obviously like that comes out as a, as a more like, well, why does this happen when everybody else is just like, well, that's just what happens in video games and board games and D&D and, and all these stories is just like, just five people get together and suddenly they're like, hey, let's go kill a dragon. And they're all like, you know what? Yeah. Okay. That works. And it does, it does make it a little odd. And I, I do struggle with that too. Um, my counter argument is something that I heard today that I really liked is it's uh, something called necessary metagaming. And it's, it's metagaming in the sense that if you don't kind of hand wave something and just let your character go along with something that they otherwise might not, it could very well just like break the game. Just derail. Oh, oh, looks like we lost. We broke Dallin. Yes, we did. <laughs> he, no, he was just, he was so offended by, by, well, by your, my counterpoint. Concept. Yep. He was just like, <laughs> I'm out of here. If my character gonna, doesn't have oh. motivation, if it doesn't feel real, I can't play any longer. <laughs> Oh, I'm leaving this out. I'm not editing any of this out. Oh, good. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm sorry I offended you so much. Uh, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think I think one of the one of the really important things is is that sometimes you have to let go of characterization in favor of keeping the game running. Because if if Tori would have said, Well, my character would not have gone with four complete strangers on a tr- a, a month-long journey up the long road, uh, then it would be a situation of like, okay, well, what does your character do then? And everybody else is going this way and you're going that way. And suddenly I got to reroll a new character. (laughs) And instead, instead we just kind of went, well, we'll figure it out on the road. And, or, you know, like we kind of hand waved a little bit. And I think, I think that is a necessary evil in D and D because at 
at heart, it is a game where you're supposed to be a party of adventurers. Yeah. So coming up with reasons is not a more of a, I need a story reason why this should happen, more of a, this is happening, so I need to justify it retroactively. Sure. sure. Okay. Let me, can, can I counter your <laughs> counter <laughs> argument? No. Well, no I, said, no, I said, oh, I said, oh, like we have a counter for it. No, you cannot. No, cannot. <laughs> My rule is absolute. That I don't know. I'm not the, the adjudicator. <laughs> of course. Yeah, Tori, go ahead. Col- Colby is the um, med- mediation ex- right. expert here. Okay. Roll a persuasion check. I don't have my dice with me. (laughs) Okay. My counter argument to that is why can't we create, why can't we go the extra mile and create that motivation? You know, instead of just saying, well, you have to go along with it. Why don't we build a motivation in there? And I, I think that there are two different parts to motivation. There's a what and a why, right? So what is my character? Like, what is the end goal here? What are they being compelled to do? I I think that part can be decided by the DM, right? That's something they can help with and say, okay, here's something, here's like a goal that we have for for your character. Here's something that they've been asked to do. Here's their what. But then as a character, you can decide what your why is, right? So why would my character be compelled to do that? Well, X, Y, Z, you know, like I, Mm -hmm. I, I came from this broken background, as they all do. We all, yeah, every, every D&D character, I, right? Yeah. yeah, I finally have some people who under who get me. And that that's going to be my why. Or, you know, maybe my my um my gods have have asked me to to be part of this group and maybe th- that's my why because I want to fulfill their wishes. Financial gain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, wanderlust and sense again, of adventure. I think you can do a backwards justification. I think that's I think that's a lot easier than the than the let's come up with the how and why in an off session so that you guys know what the like everything is and it's more of a like just a quick discussion where everybody knows the result so we're just not going to worry about it. It's more of a like okay, so we've all talked about meeting together, but why would my character want to do this? Let me go back and like think of some reasons yeah. and kind of do some some mental uh, hula hoops there or jumping jacks or whatever. Um what do you, what do you think, uh, Dallin, from from the news desk uh, in yes, uh, from the news desk here, Northern Utah? Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I I can see it both ways, and I think it's because I've sat as a player and sat as a DM, so I've seen it both ways. I think, first of all, I think a lot of players expect their DMs to give them all of the motivations, and I don't think that's very fair. Mm-hmm. I think as a player, you need to create a character that is motivated to do what, you know, whatever the game is, right? The otherwise, why are they there in the first place? So creating characters that have easy hooks for the DM to pull from to help motivate, I think is on the player's side of things. Um, but on the other side, yeah, I think to the DM, there are some tips and tricks that they can use to have these characters have a motivation, like having two characters know each other from the past or um, having a a mandate from a god or something. Just these things that kind of help pull the player maybe on those first couple episodes where there's a lot of uh, suspension of disbelief, right? To get them into the story and get them to accept the hero's journey. Um, So I think think it goes both ways. Um, But this is why you got to, we say it all the time on the show, but this is why you got to communicate with your DM and Mm -hmm. players and DMs need to talk and I don't necessarily think that your motivations need to have like an off session where you figure it out. I think a lot of DMs are just afraid to just be like, okay, hold on, pause. Like let's spend 10 minutes and like hash this out real quick. Like let's make sure we're all on the same page. I think there's so much emphasis on just like keeping the game fluid. And and I, yeah. And I see that, that there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's some times where you're just like, okay, time out. Let's like, let's all get up to speed here. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Yeah. And to to point out, just to completely derail my entire debate side here, I do agree with Tori <laughs> in, in most regards. Like having the motivation set in stone and or you know, having that planned out and know what exactly is going on and you have the what and the why all 
all purposefully set out and your character knows exactly what they're doing, that's fantastic. As a DM, especially, because like I can literally, like you said, I can literally, if there's anything that I want Eve to do or Saradon to do, I just call on their god and be like, hey, you got to do this, you know, <laughs> and they'll they'll be like, oh, well, yeah, my character definitely would go along with what the God says, you know, which has some interesting possibilities as a DM if you are uh, interested in making your characters do some morally questionable things that might rock their world a little bit later. Be on the lookout, <laughs> I suppose. But uh, <laughs> it definitely is. It definitely is one of those things where you can you can use these cheat codes, as it were, to get people to uh, work together. I think that I, I, I think that you can have it either way. I think that we kind of got off topic of what Colby was originally asking about how to get into yeah. character, though. But I mean, th- th- that's okay. And I'm like, I'm loving where where this is going and, and these things that we're all talking my, about. I mean, all my I, notes were from your other question. I'm not prepared for this. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I think I'm, I'm happy to have derailed it, though. <laughs> no, I so like I'm I'm like I'm having a lot of thoughts right now. If if there are two tips that I'm hearing. Um, it is one, um, potentially you don't have to like figure this all out at the table in the moment, you know, while the game is going. And, and, and I think that's, I think that's valid, right? It can be, it can be difficult, um, for like the energy at the table everybody else you know if you as a character need to spend 20 minutes like navel gazing you know what i mean while everybody kind of waits for you to find your motivation um that's not to say that it can't be done and and hopefully quickly and so you know to dallin's point i think uh, as dms yeah like i don't think you need to be afraid of being like you know what let's let's take a time out let's take five minutes and like let's talk through this. You know what I mean? If, if, if it's important to one or two or three players to kind of work through this for a minute, I, I, I don't imagine that it would take 20 or 30 minutes, right. To kind of help somebody work through, you know, well, well you know, why does my character want to do this? Or, you know, here's some questions that I have that like in my head, I, I, as a player want to sort of come to terms with before I can move forward because I feel like, I'm not sure how to role play this otherwise. Um, let, let me give an example um, that I that I actually think I um, that we've talked about on this show before, actually. So I won't. I'll try not to rehash it too much. But um, Bronze Battalion, a uh, game that we were playing, and I was playing this Death Cleric uh, Silme, and Preston was the DM. So I can talk about it and and throw him under the bus because he's not here. I'm actually not throwing him under the bus. <laughs> this is more this is more self criticism. It was a disaster. It, it was kind of World actually. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, very quickly, like there were basically two. I'm going to oversimplify things, but there were like two warring factions in this city and. Both of them were kind of trying to get us to 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 sort of help them take out the other one, so that they could kind of um, be the the reigning power in the in the city. Uh, we'll just say that, even though it was a little more complicated than that. Um, and for a minute there, as a party, I think we were a little bit undecided. Like, well, do we help these guys? I don't know. Well, maybe we help these guys. And and. At the end of the day, we, we decided to kind of go with one of the group. We signed a contract with them as a band of mercenaries, right, to kind of help group A take out group B. Um, but but my character and really me, you know, as a player and then sort of <laughs> by extension, my character was really frustrated because I was trying really hard to like get into the head of my character and be like, okay, but I don't really like either of these groups. Like they both seem like a gang of thugs that are gonna like do bad things. And like, potentially they're like crime bosses, you know? It's like, well, do you wanna support Al Capone or, you know, Bugsy Malone? It's like, uh, neither, like, you know what I mean? That's kind of how I was feeling. And and so I was doing a lot of like questioning of the, the, the gang boss leaders and not getting anywhere. <laughs> As far as like, well, what's your motivation and what's your plan to do when you have power? Like, uh, as though I were like a constituent in some politicians, yeah. like, you know, district. And I'm like, 
why should I vote for you? Or why should I What's kill your, your enemy? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, typical uh, politics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and they were both very vague and like, well, our business is our own. And like, you know, do you want to take this contract and do it for the money or not? And like, I just, I was, I was frustrated, right. And torn. And I guess my character was too. Right. And so in the end, what ended up happening is, well, a, I think I probably frustrated Preston with all of my questioning. <laughs> B, I probably frustrated like my fellow players with all of my questioning and like, uh, okay, can we get on with this? You know, um, and then C, at the end, when we were having our final battle with group B, trying to kill him, and, you know, group A shows up to help us. Basically, I double crossed group A and killed them too, you know, and like no one in my party was expecting it. Frankly, I wasn't really expecting it either. But, you know, it just kind of Anyway, it happened. And that was a really long story, but just kind of a way to illustrate the point of why I think for me, it's important to, to be able to get to, to the why here. And, and again, it doesn't have to like, maybe, maybe the way we handled it was not done very well, because it probably did slow down momentum, you know what I mean? And maybe kill energy and probably bored some people with all of my like, trying to trying to figure out motivation for my own character when everybody else seemed perfectly fine to just you know go forward with the plan and and so we could have maybe paused and taken a time out and been like okay like let, let's just chat about this like out of character you know kind of settle some things and or if that wasn't going to be enough like let's have a let's have an offline you know group chat about this and you know maybe we can kind of when we're not at the table and not bogging you know down the gameplay kind of discuss some of these things um so that everybody can feel comfortable about the direction that we're going in and and you know figure out you know why uh why they are okay moving forward or whatever um mm -hmm. so yeah that was a long example to to prove some of the points that you guys have already all made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think there's tips that can help you make quicker decisions and they might not be exactly what your character would do or exactly in the headspace, but can get you close. Wait, we have to, who won the debate? Oh, was it Tori um, or was it oh. myself? I mean, well, I think Tori, because you said that you agreed with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was Tori. It was right. <laughs> yeah. No. And, to be honest, that's something that I, I now want to work on as a DM a bit more. I want to find I want to find more proper motivation for my characters or and my players too. Right. Like I want them, I want them to be like, yeah, this is you know, this Invested. is what we want to do, and this is why, rather than just being like, okay, I guess we'll go along with whatever this random NPC is telling us. And and I well, think uh, to be fair, sorry, Tori. Uh, okay. I, I I think that that again just speaking personally like i am i have an i have an easier time like getting into my character and and then it really enjoy feeling more immersed in the world and like enjoying the game more when i feel like okay like like i'm in and i feel like yeah like i'm invested you know what i mean like i want to do this thing not just because like it's fun and this is how the game is played but like no like I, whatever, like my gods told me that I need to do this, or I need to help this person that I really care about, or I really need the money so I can upgrade my equipment, whatever it is. Like, it's just, I don't know. I feel like, um, I, I just, I just enjoy it more. So sorry for cutting you off, Tori. That's okay. Um, we can move on. Oh, well now I feel doubly bad. <laughs> no, it don't, don't feel bad. <laughs> don't feel bad. <laughs> It, it was it was all good. Okay. I changed my mind on on share on on what I was going to say. So okay. For, forget that that even happened. Um, if I, I had I time magic, fight. I would take it back. <laughs> and Corey, I didn't mean to be sort of dismissive of the idea of like necessary metagaming. I I think it's a very valid point, frankly. And and uh, you know, it's important, I think, as players, as DMs, to remember that like, well, yes. D&D is a story that we're all telling together. It is also a game that we're all playing. And 
depending on your table, depending on who you have at your table, some people probably prefer one aspect of it more than others. And you know what I mean? You, you kind of have to find, find that balance. But the reason that I used that example of Silme was almost to sort of say, yeah, here's an example of like, uh, like maybe how not to do it. Because again, I think the way that I handled it led to a little bit of frustration maybe on the part of like my the other players at my table and or the dm just because it was like maybe it was too much right like I at some point it. well thank you i'm glad <laughs> but I, I at least probably could have like maybe streamlined it a little bit or maybe had we paused for five minutes and just kind of talked amongst ourselves figured some stuff out or have an offline session where i kind of work through some things and now we can kind of move on um it might have been might have been better, but it didn't necessarily have to take twenty minutes or whatever in the middle of the session for me to just be like, "Oh, I'm having this crisis in my head, and like I need to figure it out." You know <laughs> what I mean? So let's yeah, let's get into some some additional sort of like tips, tricks, ideas that you guys may have either from a DM's perspective or as a, or from a player's perspective. Uh, you know, we've gone over a couple offline sessions, pausing. Um, what are some other things that that we can do to kind of help us get into our character's head and or help our players do that? All right. I got three tips. Hit us. These are three tips that I use. Okay. Um, so I know they mostly work. They have they've only let me down like once. So they're they're like 98% good. So the first one that I have written down is, I think it's a good idea to drill down your character as far as you can. Just keep asking yourself, why, 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 until you get to one word that makes up what your character is. So if you're ever put on the spot and you have to choose something and you're not sure how your character would go, kind of line up with whatever that one word is. Mm. So for example, with Ezra, it's unproven. So anytime... Mm -hmm. Something comes up, I'm like, okay, he's unproven. He's going to be trying to prove himself or show himself or show that he belongs in the group or has skills. So that's always the direction I'm going to go. Hmm. So I think that's helpful when you have to make like just a quick, like snap decision on something. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. I need to figure out what Sarah's one word is. Arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, you went that, sorry. Oh, that sorry, came out I thought we were really talking. quickly. Corey. Like, <laughs> that was fast. Really quickly. He didn't even have to ask why three times. Yep. <laughs> I am. I I am nothing but brander to you, aren't I? It's true. Yep. You are. You are the brander of the PCs to every NPC. <laughs> I, I I I I have not mentioned this, and I might even edit this out. But my middle name is Chad. I know. My when, when he was like chagrin. Chad Hansen, <laughs> he's just describing. I almost is, said, "Oh, Colby's middle name is Chad," but I didn't yeah. want to. Yeah, you guys were all to talking about that, Brander. I'm just like they're just talking. I was about dying me right now. It's it's that awkward dying. puppet meme where it's like uh, people are talking about Chad's being just handsome and arrogant, and it's Colby going. Yeah, that's so funny. I don't Colby's know. Not... I don't think you have a punchable face, though. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think some people would disagree, but I appreciate it. Let us know in the comments. I'm just kidding. I'm yeah, just <laughs> please don't. Out of the four of us, <laughs> whose face is most punchable? Oh, oh kind of I'm gonna lose that. <laughs> that ever, why would you do that? I'm gonna lose. This is gonna be a fun comment face. section. Yeah. I know it. Okay. Anyways. Um. Okay. So, so Sarah apparently is arrogant. What about Eve? I think Sarah is more like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Whimsical? Mm, that's probably because she's kind of she's more like Jekyll and Heidi. Anyway, uh, I would say I would say naive. Eve or Sarah? Naive for for Eve. Sorry for, for Eve. Eve. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I can what see that. Eve? E yeah, I mean, Eve like is if, in the if name. I asked like what is like what's my my why I I don't know like naive would not be like a motivating sure. factor sure so yeah. I don't know I'll have to think about that I, okay. I love that idea though Dallin That's however awesome. however when it comes down to like a character choice thinking about your character in the terms of my character is naive therefore they may be more trusting and more willing to accept help like I think I think sure. naive is a great it may not be a great why, but it is definitely a great um, way to kind of give yourself that snap Explain. decision. Yeah. 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 Sure. 
Um, I would say though, maybe like every 10 sessions, update your if it doesn't yeah. if it mm -hmm. doesn't fit anymore yeah. because yep. of course you're going to change yeah characters um, should so progress that. yeah okay tip um, number two okay tip number two connect yourself to your character in some sort of physical way hmm. and so for me this is just like having the image in my head of what my character looks like right so before i leave like i pull up a picture or whatever like whatever my inspiration is for it and just kind of Okay, this is what my character is. So that way I'm thinking of them in like a physical manifested way, right? So that helps me kind of get more into their character, get into their voice, which helps me then get into the headspace. So I'm that's shaving, I'm shaving the side of my head. Do it. Yeah, do it. Do it. Yeah, I think to, though, to honestly, add to that. The, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I love that idea, Dallin. And like, I don't think you have to go full blown like method actor, like Jared Leto put dead rats in people's dressing rooms or things like that. But I, um, I, again, whenever I was in a play, um, mm -hmm. I just would like practice my lines on the way to the theater, like mm -hmm. in my character's voice. Mm -hmm. And so I do that same thing, even though I don't have like rehearsed same. lines, like when we're driving mm -hmm. when I'm driving to Corey and Scott's, I always have like conversations in my yep. character's voice and it really helps me get into character. Yeah, I, I have a Spotify playlist that's specifically mm -hmm. created for my character All right. that I listen to on the way over. My, awesome. my favorite method of physical connection is posture. Mm -hmm. uh, certain certain characters have certain postures, certain inflections that they do. Um, one of the one of the characters that I just came up with that we did in the one shot game was Mungo. And I made sure that when I got into the mongo headspace it was very slouched it was very much like like i'm i'm the biggest guy in the room and i don't care if anybody notices it kind of thing unlike my usual where i'm the biggest guy in the room and nobody should know because it's me it's awkward <laughs> but no it, it definitely is one of those things where it's just like you know i i, I definitely like you, you get in that kind of shoulders back to get into your character or your character sits up a little straighter than you would normally because they're they're more prim and proper kind of thing and that definitely helps me and especially as a gm where i'm constantly shifting roles it helps kind of guide my specific character like when we were playing uh bronze battalion that same game with Sylvie, i was playing a, an old wizened uh total wizard and i literally would like hunch forward with and drop staff. my glasses down and i'd have my staff <laughs> yeah. with me mm -hmm. yeah and a prop helps obviously but i i would get into like the old man kind of like mm, yeah sure of course yeah kind of thing because yeah. it's easier to it's easier to remember that i am my character and to act as my character when the posture is already there for me mm -hmm. Tip number three. Okay, the last tip. And I, I bet a lot of us already do this, but making a character that is somewhat an extension of you in a way. So that way you're not really having to change your headspace that much. Mm. So for example, like it's yourself, but you're just really good at fighting or mm. it's you, but you have a really dark secret because you're a warlock or whatever. So that way you don't, you're not changing headspace all that much. It's easier to make decisions that way. Sure. I think I think that's especially good for people who are like new to to D and D, and 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 then I also would be willing to bet that a lot of uh, particularly veterans would be like, okay, I want to do something like that's totally different, right? Um, than than myself. I personally have a hard time still, so I guess I'm just the eternal novice uh, doing that um, because. I don't know. I like, like, it's the same reason we've talked about this down, like why in mass effect, I can never like be a renegade. I can never <laughs> like be like an evil character in a video game. Cause I'm always like, Oh, I feel too guilty. Um, me. You have but, like mm -hmm. a permanent smile on your face, Colby. <laughs> You're just like, yeah, such you a can't happy make person. the bad choice. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you frown. Uh, do it right now. <laughs> that just looks like adorable pouting. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't like frowning. It takes more muscles to frown than it takes to smile. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard you work say out like your face muscles. Angry you would swear have a muscular either. jaw. Oh, I've I've heard Colby swear on the very rare occasion, and yeah, it is it, happens. it is completely jarring for the entire <laughs> character of what he is. But like I, angry I, swear words. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Really? We, usually when it's a recording thing goes wrong, <laughs> like right. you missed, you missed the one time where he didn't start recording. We got 10 minutes into the video before he, <laughs> he just exclaimed right in the middle. And it was at his house too. His kids yeah. were home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Trouble, no, I think, I think that we all put a little bit of ourselves in every character, no matter, no matter who, how many characters you've created, there's always yeah. a little bit of you in there. And it's because it's just easier to, it's easier to connect and it's easier to come up with that connection. If you really like find that one thing that you have in common with that character, whether it be just like, oh, this person finds this type of flower very interesting. And so do I, or, you know, this, this person is me, but my arrogance is ratcheted up to 11 or this person is me. If I were a complete a-hole, you know, some, sometimes a Lucan has to exist. Yeah. (laughs) I was I was thinking Luke in a little bit more uh, for that one just because that one and there are certain characters that are hard like that you come up with that you're like I want to play this character but it's really hard for me to actually play it because it is so far removed from who I actually am I'm just like you Colby I can't play the bad guy in video games I play the bad guy all the time in D&D but when it comes Mm -hmm. to like playing Skyrim and I'm, I'm going through the storyline, it's never like, oh, I'm just going to kill you. You know, it's never the the bad choice. It's always like, yeah. yes, for the 10th time, I'll help you because that's just what I would do. Right, you know, right. I don't right. know. It's pretty easy to go out and play Grand Theft Auto and just go on a pedestrian accident spree <laughs> and just run over everybody. I'm going to play Grand Theft Auto and I'm just going to do perfect driving the entire time. Obey just like, all the traffic, yeah, obey all the traffic yes. rules. Yeah. Making yeah. sure I get a great rate on my progressive insurance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every, not a sponsor. Every time, not a, sponsor. Every time <laughs> yeah, yeah. a criminal comes up and they're like, hey, I've got this job for you. I'm going to be like, no, thanks. I'm going to go to my uh, job as a high school teacher that I've been working in Grand Theft Auto for so 10 fun. years. <laughs> so, okay. So I've got a tip for DM and it's um just based on experience so we had um in in one of our recent anaria sessions um there was uh, one of these what felt a little bit like a random encounter um which for the record i don't think there's anything wrong with random encounters right um we were almost to terabon right and and all of a sudden there are these farmers running down the road screaming and these land shark things pop out of the ground and eat start eating them and attacking them and and of course being the good adventurers that we are we jump to their defense and we rescue them and we kill the we kill the what are they called bullets bullets yeah um yeah. we kill the bullets and uh and then like we went on our merry way <laughs> and <laughs> and i was driving home that night and just like had this like you know uh needle on the record scratch moment was like and i was like wait a second like what just happened like what what like why why would where did those monsters come from like are the farmers okay like why were they being attacked in the first place like and and you know thinking like what surely my character would have been like okay like what's going on here are you guys okay? Where are you going? Do you need an escort to get there? Like, are these attacks going to keep happening? Why did this happen in the first place? Like, did we need to get to the bottom of something, you know? And so having one of those moments at the beginning of the next session, we kind of worked through it. And so, and, and Corey, to his credit was just like, you know, obviously he could see that as players, we were like, we're struggling with this. And he was just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And, and then we all went, Oh, okay, good. Like, that's all I needed. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, well, it's because this forest is encroaching on this land. And there's kind of always this conflict going on. So I guess the tip would be, you know, as a DM, like, it doesn't have to be some grand, like, everything is connected to the overarching plot here, though, this Mm -hmm. is going to turn into some twist later, it could just be, it could be a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A a MacGuffin. A monster of the week. Yeah, you know Uh, what I mean? Like, yeah, like, like, oh, like, here's the reason. And, 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 and a lot of the time, like, that's all I think uh, players need. Maybe not for every yeah. situation, right? Um, Tori, welcome back. Um, She's got so offended at <laughs> what Koi was saying, right? Right? Yeah. That's, the, that's was, always the story? She was so very offended. She was super offended. I came out of the birthing portal, by the way. <laughs> As wow. We you all. already have a house right, straight out of the birthing portal? That's amazing. Wow. Talk about <laughs> 1%. <laughs> <laughs> no i and honestly really? like Banjo. that that encounter was literally a random encounter right sure. and that was that was all it was and everybody kind of recognized that but it did like it did have that moment of like oh well we probably should like 
maybe ask why yeah. <laughs> in this case we've got people around that we're running we should ask them at least if they're okay kind of thing well and then um, afterwards too like okay like is there is this is there a larger problem here that we can address is this like you know what I mean? Just a, like, again, just thinking about how would I react in that situation? I don't think I would be like, kill the monsters, job done, like on our merry way. It do, it did make me go, okay, why why do the Arcanum not intervene more? And what are the motivations for the individual um, NPC guard factions around the world? And why is there this huge, like, mil, not military, but mercenary uh, trade in Salzport, for example, or in, other, in these other places when there should be guards to handle that kind of thing. Right. And it really makes you examine uh, what exactly your world is about. And I think I think as a GM, it's a great tip to have those motivations, not and for your characters and for factions and cities, right? Because a faction in a city is a character all its own. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and again, like, uh, like, every random encounter doesn't need to have some big overarching, like sometimes you're in the forest and you get attacked by monsters because I, we live in a world where monsters live in the forest and they attack people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And sometimes like yeah. that's all it needs to be. Um, but, but, but sometimes like it can be more than that. And, you know, and, and again, if, if you've established something like, well, there's this, uh, there's this n noble house that's in charge of protecting this road. And it's like, well, how come they're not protecting the road? Where well, are they? Yeah. yeah you know what yeah, I mean? Now there's a plot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, that we're still currently investigating. Mm -hmm. Um, I know what happens soon. Okay. I hope, uh, what else? What are some other tips, Tori? Okay. Um, sorry. Nope. I, I, I'm not going to say anymore. Just <laughs> kidding. Do it. I was going to say twice. Just do it. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. So something that I think, um, is helpful for me is of course to have like a really fleshed out backstory and some way, some fun things that you could do to help determine like who your character is to, to help with those motivations is, like maybe write up like a day in the life for your character. Um, so like on a day-to-day -day basis, when they're not adventuring, what do they do? Like, are they a, a morning person? Do, do they wake up early or do they like to sleep in? Cause that might like determine a little bit how they react when they wake up one morning, someone waking them up and they're going to be super grumpy because they're used to sleeping in or like, um, when they, uh, maybe they take like a nap during the day. Some people do that. I don't have that luxury in my life, but you know, so when they're in the middle of a, a combat and it's during nap time, they're going to be little grumpy grumps and might make <laughs> like decisions based on um, that exhaustion factor or like who, who do they normally spend time with during the day? Like, are they missing those people or um, are, 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 do they hate those people? Are they really grateful to be away from them? Um, so it, it could be something as easy as writing up just a little, like, here's what my character would normally do in their off time. Um, another thing that's been super helpful to me is, so when I was writing my backstory for Eve, I just started writing these letters and that's kind of where like the letter recaps came from was I originally wrote my backstory in letter form, but it was really great because it gave me these opportunities to like come up with little memories for my character to be like, oh, remember that one time when we did this? That was so fun. And then we can pull like the Luna Berries thing. Mm -hmm. That was part of a letter and my backstory. And, and that was really fun to just like pull into the game, uh, the gameplay. Um, it, it can just be little things like something that happened in your childhood, and, like from a, a personal <laughs> narrative. When I was four years old, I, I had accidentally punched my arm through a, a pane glass window for a, a, a screen door. I would have been fine, but I pulled my arm back through. And so I have this huge scar on my right wrist and I've always been super, super self-conscious about it. Like it's such a silly thing, but it's something that like, I'm kind of insecure about. So maybe your character has something like that and it might affect how they react to things. Mm. So that, that, that would be my suggestion is, is really flesh out your backstory because it, it, it allows you to have some fun, fun interactions in the game and, and bring in some flavor that maybe wouldn't have been there otherwise, if you didn't have like those little memories to pull from. Yeah. And, and those memories can drive your character's motivations too forward. Right. Right. Because right? like, if your character remembers, oh yeah, I went, I went 
fishing this one time and this creature came out and attacked me and now like the water terrifies me a little bit then going on an aquatic venture adventure might cause your characters more anxiety and it might cause them to act in certain ways right um one thing that we haven't touched on yet that dnd provides you mm -hmm. is your character like motivations flaws bonds. and yeah, yeah those yeah. those bonds uh your your alignment they, mm -hmm. These are all great factors for helping you get into character. They're not the end all be all for your character because nobody is 100% good all the time or nobody is 100% chaotic all the time. Um, but it is definitely one of those things where I can be like, oh, well, let, let, let me take a look at my bonds and flaws here. And I go, oh, yeah, I have this bond where I don't I don't like to disappoint uh, my superiors mm -hmm. and so this guard captain technically is a superior in that way so i want to make sure that i please them yeah. you know or it could be your flaws that you don't trust anybody but yourself and you're like you're like okay well then i'm definitely going to be scrutinizing these people more and i'm gonna i'm gonna ha be very closed off with the party for a while until i start working on that flaw yeah uh, no i like that and 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 i often forget to like i'll, I'll create my character check all those boxes and then sometimes forget about them. Right. And so revisiting them, I think is, is good. One, one thing I was going to mention is, you know, I think a lot of this can be um, improved by like a good session zero. Uh, like, and we've talked about it several times, including an entire episode dedicated to session zero. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but just like, as an example, uh, Tori in her first ever well, DM campaign experience for us was running Storm King's Thunder. And, you know, I wish that we would have done a session zero for that, I think, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, it was a bunch of adventures. We kind of got to this town, saved this town. And then, um, and then at the end of that, to sort of get us to the next part of the adventure, like one of the townspeople was like, hey, I have a sister that lives in this town that's like, five million miles away to the north like would you guys go deliver a message for her and we were all like yeah okay and you know off we went on our merry way and and that was another one of those moments where i was like wait a second <laughs> like why 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 would my character do this and like yeah like i had these other things that i was trying to accomplish like that's on the other side of the world like we just saved your town. Is that not enough? Now I have to be like a courier for you. And this is not a knock against you, Tori, frankly. This is a knock no, against really Wizards of the Coast who wrote a really, a really bad hook. Um, right. For, to, <laughs> but so, so having like a, a good session zero, I think might've helped us kind of go, okay, why do we know each other? What are our characters' motivations? Yeah. Like, where are we? What's the state of the world right now? Okay, giants are attacking, you know, and maybe we are interested in getting to the bottom of that. And, and maybe... Uh, well, we were going to go to the north anyway to explore kind of what's happening with the giants. And so, sure, if you've got a sister there, well, that's on our way. We'll stop by this town and deliver your message for her, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, um, and so, yeah, I think figuring out some of these, who are we? What are we doing? What are our characters' motivations? You know, what's the state of the world? Uh, kind of things will really help to avoid some of that. Well, like, why are we doing this, and what's going on? Kind of, kind of things that that otherwise would crop up. Yeah, I'm just thinking about it. it's just dawning on me. It might be a good character motivation to just have wonderlust and just want to explore because then you're like, sure. I'm down for whatever. Sure. And then it doesn't even matter what yeah. kind of hooks and, are. You're just like, yeah, I'm down for anything. And I'm willing to bet that a lot of people create their D and D characters with sort of that in mind. I'm an adventurer. Like I want to get loot, find gold, see the world, you know, have adventures. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, I don't need a lot of motivation to just like go, you know, mm -hmm. kill monsters and uh, explore the world and face dangerous things. And, you know, it's all exciting and fun and yeah, let's do it. Um, but anyway, okay. We have gone way long. I don't really care that much because I've really enjoyed this conversation. But um, what, what? Anything that we're missing? Any additional tips, tricks, ideas, counter arguments, things to consider when we're thinking about how to get into our character's head? Find what works for you, and mm -hmm. then you do you, boo. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we'll wrap. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you for watching. Uh, love you guys. Appreciate all that you do for us, all of your support. Um, and thanks to my DMs. You guys are awesome. And uh, 
I miss seeing you. I've been, uh, I've been on vacation and it's been a while. So I'm really looking forward to getting together to play again. Um, but anyway, like, and subscribe and comment and join and all of the things and, and check out the rest of the content on the channel. If you haven't, uh, you know, the D and D university, the tales of an area, all that stuff uh, is, is, is out there waiting to be consumed. And I think it's pretty good stuff. So anyway, I like it. I yeah. mean, have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon and uh, take care. Thanks guys. See ya.